Going up top. Okay. Alrighty. Hello, everybody. Alrighty. God is good. Before we sit down, I would like for all of us, Alan, if you don't mind taking that, to read from the book of Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, verse 3, and verse 19. So Matthew chapter 7, if you would, very quickly. If you don't have a physical Bible, it's okay. You can just read the one on your phone. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate that. Oh, you got it. Thanks, man. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 7. Alrighty. So verse 1, what does it say? Is a scripture that we all, I think most of us are very familiar with. It says, judge not that you be not judged. And it says, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eyes, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Now verse 19, amazing scripture here. It says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because your word says that it is the same measure with which we measure that will be measured back to us. So Lord, let the consciousness of your heavenly principles, of your divine ordinances, remain the guide for every thought and every action of our hearts. And as we continue today in the ministry of the word, to listen to what you have by your Holy Spirit today, hearts will be illuminated, paths will be illuminated, and more importantly, Lord, each and every one of us will receive the willingness, will have the willingness in us stead up to do that which your word says in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let us all be seated. Praise God. Praise God. Antoine, good to see you. Good to see you. Been a minute. Uh, you know, I have to say that just in case you see somebody else and you're telling them, oh, it's been a minute. They can tell you, yeah, it's been a minute. Alrighty, God is good. I'm excited to be here. And um, I think this is the first service that I am attending in a long time where my wife isn't here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Not just me. We've got other people whose wives are away this weekend. And um, we just thank God that um, they're having a great time where they're at. Um, I've received a couple of updates from the um, women's retreat. And they seem to be having so much fun. So it is on us who are here today to not feel left behind but to also have our own fun. You know how it can be sometimes when you know some people are away and they're having a good time, you may be feeling left behind. Do not succumb to the feeling of being left behind. This is not the rapture, okay? This is just a retreat, they'll be back. But in the meantime, we will have a great time in the presence of God. Let me prepare our hearts for one of the things that the Lord revealed to me concerning this meeting that got me really excited and really fired up. And the Lord did let me know that there are several of us who know of the things that God has for us, the blessings that he has for us. However, it is always as if there is still a wall between you and the blessing. That there is still opposition between you and the blessing. You know because you look into the word of God and he says that you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing where? In heavenly places. You know because the word of God says that everything that pertains to your life and godliness has God perfected. The Bible also says that you being evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. That no, none of you will be asked by his child for a bread and then will give out a stone. Your son doesn't come to you and say, Dad, can I have a fish? And then you give them a serpent. And the Lord is saying, I know that you are evil. What you like to do all the time is throw stones. But then you know how to look after your own. I know what you want to be in the lives of other people because of the sin nature that you inherited in Adam is to be a snake in other people's lives, to bite them, to deceive them. God says being evil, having that human carnal nature, these are your natural tendencies. He says, but when you're dealing with your own, even you know how to find good gifts. And God is saying, how about me who is a good God? Do you think there is anything that you need that I will not provide? Jesus told a cross section of people once before. He said, why do you even consider worrying as a thing 
He says, you've been worrying all your life. What has he done for you? He says, by worrying, you have not been able to add a cubit to your weight. Neither have you been able to increase your height by a span. A span is about that much, six inches. He says, you've not been able to do any one of those things by worrying. He says, do you not know that your heavenly father knows the things that you have need of even before you ask? So because we have read scriptures and we know these things, I mean, there's hardly any one of us who's been around the people of God for a while. Who's not picked up one or two promises from the scripture? Even if you don't pick up the Bible on your own, there is always that sister who is also always confessing, and hey, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. There is that brother who is always saying, oh, I know there is laid for me a crown of glory. You always see people around you claiming and professing the promises of God, particularly when it comes to the things of the material world. You don't hear too many people claiming Promises like this in the Bible that I wish above all things that you may be an express manifestation of the glorious image of God in Christ Jesus. Many people don't care as much about things like that as they do physical healing, as they do money in their pocket. But whether it is the material or whether it is the things of godliness, the Bible says that your heavenly father has it all taken care of. So why don't you have those things in your life? Why aren't you living in the abundance of the things that have since been promised? I have news for you today. There is no way to access the things that have been provided without you understanding the mechanism of opening the gates and opening the doors. The Bible says, lift up your head, all you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and let the king of glory come in. You see, in the realm and in the dimension that we are mostly active and mostly functional, which is in the physical realm, there are times wherein things just naturally respond to force. When the wind blows, what happens? The leaves will part ways. When fire consumes, things are reduced to ashes. But because of the infinite requirement for the things that are in the realm of the spirit by God to be resilient and to stand the test of time, the things in heaven don't move so easily. And where are your blessings? The Bible says every single one of the blessings that God has for you that you have yet to receive or enjoy is where? Is in heavenly places. They're in a spiritual state and they are in heavenly places. And so for the windows of heaven to open, you know what to do. However, for the doors to be open, that is where many of us get stuck. Many of us get stuck because let me tell you something. There are two ways by which you can receive an open heaven. One of the ways is by giving to God what is God's. He says, try me and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you a blessing such that you will not have room enough to contain. Look at everybody who tithed in the Bible. They received blessings that they had room not enough to contain. People like Abraham, even up until the third and the fourth generation, people were still getting blessed to the point where it became an issue. Oh yeah, yeah, you know that kind of blessing where it is? I was like, oh wow, now what do we do? By the time he got to Solomon, Solomon received or inherited so much blessing that in one day he slaughtered 1,000 bulls just to say thank you to God. 1,000. I'm not talking about 100. 1,000 at a time wherein there's probably only one or two nations in the world that could afford to do that. Other people are still trying to survive. And here is somebody who has been able, who was able to give so extravagantly. And that is because the inheritance was there and it was genuine. So I tell people, you can open the windows of heaven by doing that, by tithing. This is not a giving message. You know our position about giving here. But another way by which you can receive an open heaven is to know where to stand and when to stand there. Even though we know that historically, some people somewhat have found it from their perspective accidentally. Let me give you an example. Jacob did not know that the blessing that he received from his father was already functional in his life. And one of the things that Isaac prayed over Jacob was that as the father, Abraham, was blessed by God with a relationship that was instrumental to what him having faith, Jacob would enjoy the same. 
And so Jacob did not even know what he was doing. He didn't know that he was being led by the Spirit of God when he took the path that he was on and he was found in a place where the heavens were opened and the angels of the Lord were ascending and descending. Divine placement, divine positioning, and divine timing also allows for the windows to open. But it is not every blessing that comes through the windows. It is not every blessing that comes through the windows. There are certain blessings that can only be wheeled out through the doors. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says that if the king of glory would come through, those gates will first of all be lifted and the doors will have to be opened. Let me explain this very carefully. Because I know that some of you are familiar with the verse of scripture that says where God was encouraging you to be bold and be strong. And it says, go out in joy and be led forth in peace for the mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing and the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Some of you live with that mentality of I don't have to do anything. God says to go out in joy and be led forth in peace and everything is going to be set. But those are things that are already on the earth. The mountains, the trees, they can open up. But there are things, depending on their longevity, who need a little push before they open up. So today we're going to pray toward the end of the sermon. But I want you to pray this prayer a little differently. And the prayer that we will say is that it is time for the gates to be lifted up and for the doors to be open. I want you to be able to visualize it. You see, there is a difference in you just praying because it's written and it's, and then when you are praying because it's been revealed. When you can visualize and see what you are praying about, what it does is it allows you to be operating in a multi-dimensional capacity. The Bible says that God is not only committed to granting the things that you say, God is also committed to granting the things that you can imagine. You know, many of us, we let our imagination go away simply because our thoughts are not pruned. We keep too much cares on our hearts. And so you have learned that if you go in the place of prayer to pray, you're always thinking about bills to pay. You're always thinking about the person that may not be happy with you. You're always thinking about the wrong that you have done. And because of all of those things, we have taught ourselves to decommission our imagination and only go to God with words that quite often do not even express our confidence. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that my God <coughs> is willing and is able to give to you exceedingly and abundantly above Alan, what you ask and what you imagine. So today I want you to be ready to bring out your imagination when it comes to seeing the gates lifted and the doors open. I will help you out here because the Bible says freely have you received, freely give. I have freely received of God a picture that I want to share with you. I will, I've been talking to the Lord about the gates for a little bit, particularly in the season that we're in, because I keep hearing it. Lift up your head, O ye gates. Be lifted, ye everlasting doors. I keep hearing it. And by the grace of God, in the early hours of today, the Lord brought to me, through the ministry of his angel, a vision of what the gate looks like. It wasn't what I was expecting. The gates were made of gold bars and gold joints. And the door was made out of wood. And the moment I saw it, I knew there was a reason why my attention was drawn to that particular detail. And this is what the Lord started to break down to me through the ministry of his angel that brought me that vision. He said to me, he says, you are the gate. I am the door. <laughs> like I told you, it wasn't what I expected, but it made a lot of sense to me. And I know that now that that ordinance has been committed to me and I get to share it with you, the onus is now on us to activate that picture for the breakthrough that we need. I said, Lord, I am the gate. He said, you are the gate. Because the gate that I saw was made of gold. 
Now, the way that it works, because in order for us to be able to appreciate and to recognize the workings of the things of heaven, we need to, first of all, start to track the things of the earth. What did Paul say? Paul said in the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 20, he said from the visible elements of this world, from the things that we can see and feel and touch and hold and comprehend, he says we have an understanding of the invisible attributes of God and of the eternal powers. Do you know why that is? Because the Bible says that the things that are seen are a function of the things that are unseen. So when I was yet to be on the stage, the invisible powers of heaven came to the earth and created things as a reflection of their abilities. And now, after having gone back to heaven when their work was done, the only way by which I can truly grasp their nature is by looking at what is made. What did the Bible say concerning us in the book of Genesis? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. In fact, I think we should read it. If you don't mind, let's go to Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. So that the theologians that get to watch this message later on do not castigate us from only reading from the New Testament without reading from the Old. Because the Bible says, a scribe that is instructed in the things of God brings from his treasures things that are both old and new. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, what does it say? The Bible says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let us dial back one step. The ultimate goal, folks, is for our authority to be effective. The ultimate goal is for us to be effective in the authority that Jesus paid for with his own life. You know that man once had dominion and man lost the dominion. But one of the things that man remains, even though he's lost the dominion, man remains the gate between the unseen and the seen. When was the last time you were at Walmart and then you saw a demon shopping for groceries? No, you don't. But you see people that are demon possessed. There is nobody here in this room who has ever shook hands with a demon or be, you've not been asked by a demon on the train to get up because he wants to sit. Because the Bible calls them spirits. They are un unclean spirits. They are disembodied spirits. They do not have a physical facade like you and I have. And so in order for them to get anything done on the earth, they need a gate to come through. When God is going to do anything on the earth, he needs a gate. Have you not seen times in heaven where in God just had enough? Or maybe he had just had enough of something going on on the earth. And he will call a meeting of the Elohim and say to them, who shall we send? Who will go for us? Because we designed the system in such a way that it is not welcoming to intruders. Because anybody that intrudes... He's called a thief. Jesus says, anybody who comes through the window is a thief. A door. The door is there for rightful entry. He says, the thief comes through the window. He said, but anyone who has rightful access will come in through the door. Ladies and gentlemen, we may have lost dominion in Adam, but we still remain the gate by which anyone will have presence on the earth that is legal. The other day, somebody asked me the question. He said, what is the meaning of the only begotten Son of God? You know, Jesus was speaking concerning himself in John chapter 3 verse 16. The Bible says, Jesus speaking for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Jesus had to make that clear because there had been several, several sons of God who had penetrated the earth before Jesus came. But they were not begotten. Some of them were on assignments wherein they came in here on vessels that we sometimes call chariots of fire. But they only came in. I think we may have to wait until 
Zuriel comes down. Praise God. Thank you. So let me tell you something, folks. These people would come on assignments. Some of them were called watchers. They were stationed in the air so that they can observe the workings of the sons of men. Some of them were given the access to come upon the earth with very clear instructions of how to make themselves manifest upon the earth. But they were not supposed to reside here. The ones who attempted to reside here, what did the Lord say? The Lord say, concerning the ones who did not retain their original estate, but came into the daughters of men to raise children and to make their abode with the ones that they chose, have a place prepared for them in Sheol that is called Tartarus. And we know their judgment was very severe simply because penetrating this realm without coming through the right channel is not welcomed by God. You can visit, you can look around. That's why they call them watchers. They were supposed to just watch and not touch. But they decided to do more than watching. They decided to touch. And God sent Michael to deal a blow on them and to imprison them until the last days. So we know very clearly that the workings of God is such that the principles that he has laid down are supposed to be respected and he put a gate between here and there. And look at what he said here. The Bible says the reason why he made us in his image and in his likeness is so that we can have dominion over the earth so that we can be his full representatives on the earth. We lost that dominion and when Jesus Christ came, he gave us more than dominion. He gave us authority in heaven and on earth. When Adam was made and he was given dominion, he wasn't given dominion over heaven. He just existed as a gate upon the earth. But when Jesus came, he says, now I have given you authority. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. It's a quantum kind of power. So when you move it in this realm, it automatically shifts in the heavens. But still, many of us are not experiencing this level of authority in our lives. I'm going to continue describing the gate to you in a moment, but I want to quickly show you something that I wrote here for your benefit. I decided to write it down because I'm like, this time around, I want to deliver it the way that I also heard it. The way that I heard it is that the Lord Jesus, he left his glory. Gold all through scripture symbolizes glory. He left glory to take the place of a man. And what is man? Man is a tree. Before the Lord, man is seen as a tree. When Job was having a discourse with his friend, he said, is not man, even the son of man, before the Lord, a tree? A man is like a green olive tree in the presence of the Lord. Some places were referred to as a well. Some places were referred to as a tree. But the Lord himself said concerning you and me, he says, ye are like green olive trees in the house of your God. And so when the tree is alive, it's green and luscious. But when it dies, what does it become? It becomes a wood. And so that is the reason why when Jesus came, he left his glory. He left the status of being gold and he took on the status of being wood. You see, from the visible elements of this world, we have an understanding of the things that are unseen. Why? Because, like I said earlier on, the seen is a product of the unseen. When the tabernacle in the wilderness was being built, what happened? God summoned Moses to come to the top of the mountain. And then he showed him his presence. He showed him the courts of heaven. And he told him how they can replicate that upon the earth. He says, my presence will reside in the ark, but the ark must be made of wood that is overlaid in gold. That is the reason why our authority is not going to be functional if we do not put on Christ because Christ is that gold. He is the embodiment of the glory of God. The Bible says in him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So what we're looking at here is the fact that Jesus was the gold that became wood so that you that is wood can be overlaid with that gold. So when I saw the golden gate, I knew that that was man. And Jesus says, I am the door. And he is the word of God. And the Bible says concerning the word of God that it is forever settled in heaven. And that is the reason why the Bible says, lift up your head, O you gates, but be lifted up, ye everlasting doors. You see, every single word of God that you are professing and that you are claiming is a door that leads to the abundance that God has for you in the realm of the spirit. But you need to know how to align yourself with the door so that you can be lifted up and let the door open.
You see, that alignment is where most of us miss it. So take that one thing that I have said so far. Be ready to visualize that when we're praying. As we're praying, I want you to visualize that gate, that golden gate being lifted on your behalf and for the door to swing open so that you can access, be received, so that you can receive and have access to return to enjoy the provision that he has for you. But let me show you one thing real quick that will connect the dot even better. The Bible says that God made man in his image and in his likeness. The critical thing that many of us are missing that we need to understand concerning the work that God has chosen to do in our lives is that we have failed to be like our heavenly father in our ability to deliver. Huh, let me explain that again. You know, we read Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7 says, judge not that you may not be judged. And then by the time we read verse 19, what does he say in verse 19? In verse 19, it says that a good fruit comes from where? A good fruit comes from a good tree. tree. But let me tell you something that I didn't emphasize when I was reading it on purpose, but I want to exercise that now so that you and I can see it. You see, the Bible says in verse 19 that every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Many of us, the reason why we will be cast away from God is because when we show up before God, we don't look like we belong to him. And God is not going to house someone else's child in his house. That is wrong. Every child needs to go home to their parent. So when you show up and you fail to bear the attributes of the one who begat you, then your legitimacy becomes questionable. You see, you have to be mindful of the fact that heaven is constantly aware of those who used to be in heaven. A third of heaven's population was once kicked out and those boys have been desperately trying to get back. And so heaven's vigilance is always at an all-time high simply because any rogue spirit that tries to return to a place in heaven that it was their place that is no more is immediately cast back down. And I'm going to prove that to you in a minute. You see, one of the things that we know was that Satan and the third of the angels in heaven, they had a place in heaven. They were citizens of heaven. They were doing their work and living their lives. And when they rebelled against God, Michael got up and threw all of them out. And when they threw them out, what else did they do? They made sure that they deleted every place that was theirs in heaven. Why would they do that? Simply because when God made the heavens and the earth, God made the earth a mirror image of heaven. Before men fell, before sin came into this realm, the earth was like heaven. How do we know that? The Bible says that concerning the earth, that the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. How can my will be done in an environment that is completely alien to where I reside and expect the same result? That is called unfair, unjust. The Bible says if you measure that measure has to be consistent because an unjust measure is an abomination to God. And so when God made everything, he made the earth. And I told you that the day the Lord revealed it to me, he showed me the firmament of the heavens. He said the reason why I set the firmament before I made anything else is because the firmament should be a mirror that I look into and he shows me what I have put in heaven so that I can put the same upon the earth. And so I tell you one thing for a fact, that everything that is in heaven is replicated on the earth. And when these guys were kicked out, they understood the quantum physics of the working of the things of heaven. If their places were not deleted, they will continue to operate things in heaven from the earth. It is like telling me not to come to the office anymore because I am a bad employee, but you did not delete my password and my account. Okay, I'm not going to come to your little cubicle. I'm tired of it anyway. But from my house, I will lock in and I'll be wasting your printer. I'll just send all kinds of junk to the printer just for the fun of it. Because I can do that over the network, couldn't I? I can lock in and, ac and access the logistic department and shut down all the lights and make sure that I turn on the heating in the CEO's office when summer is 89 degrees outside so that the men can be sweating just because he threw me out. 
Because of the fact that we are only just getting there now, but heaven has always been there. Wherein those that are outside of heaven, if they still have a place, guess what? They can operate things in heaven. That's the reason why Jesus told his disciples, you know, this is one part of the thing that many of us we misunderstood for several years. You know, because many people, majority of Christians, unfortunately, still believe that the reason why Jesus came to die is so that we can go to heaven and be singing praises forever. And I'm like, God already had the angels doing that. How lazy can you get? You want to go to heaven to do a job that's already been done so that you can say, well, I don't have to do anything. They're doing it. So why am I here? And I've challenged you multiple times to search the scriptures. If you will find anywhere in scriptures wherein it was said that believers will live with God in heaven forevermore. No, we will live with the Lord Jesus in the new Jerusalem, but that is not the reason why Jesus came. Jesus came to restore man to the place where he fell from, wherein he was supposed to have dominion upon the earth and see the earth fully be a reflection of heaven. And so when Jesus was leaving, he told his disciples, he says, I am going to prepare a place for you. He said, because in my father's house, there are many mansions. And that is what theologians have always challenged me with. They would say to me, Brother Moses, if God doesn't want us to be in heaven forever, why did he send Jesus to come here to announce to us that he was making mansions for us in heaven? And I said to them, but at what particular point in time did he say that we are going to be in those mansions forever? On the contrary, what he said in Luke 17, which he emphasized again in Luke 21, is where I am, there you will be also. So now that he is seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father, there needs to be a place for us in heaven. Otherwise, our authority on the earth is not functional in heaven. The reason why he made mansions is so that we can have a place in heaven with which to wield authority. When I make a demand for anything to be supplied to me, guess where it is first taken? It is first taken to my mansion in heaven where all my spiritual blessings have been provided for and it is not left to me by faith to sink my house here with my mansion in heaven. I'm going to say that again slowly because we need to break the yoke of laziness, spiritual laziness upon our lives because many of us are expecting every single work to be done for us. Yes, Jesus has finished the work at Calvary. He finished the work of your salvation so that you can now begin to exercise the authority that comes with the package. It is like someone saying, oh, I've been wanted to eat at that restaurant forever, but I've not been able to afford it. And I said to them, okay, I will pay for you to come to the restaurant. And then they get to the restaurant and they open their mouth and they point to me, <gasps> feed. I'm like, no, you're not ready. It is only enjoyable when you do it yourself. I have provided it, but you need to be able to take it. Don't worry, this message connects to what I was telling you on Tuesday about the fact that the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent will take it by force. Jesus has done what he needs to do. And now that we are in hell, we are supposed to grab all of what is ours before he blows the trumpet because many of us will come out of this tribulation experience empty because they did not recognize that they were in the place where all of what was stolen from them was kept. When I said now that we're in hell, someone says, wow, I'm not in hell. I'm in America. Let me tell you something. Jesus is the truth. He said, as I am, so are you. He said, what they do to me, they will do to you. He says, the works that I do, shall you do even greater works. And so if Jesus had to go to hell to take the key that he gave to you, where will the rest of the stuff that's been stolen from you be retrieved from? You think you will command Satan to go and bring your joy that he stole last year and bring it to you now? He's not going to do that. He's a thief. Thieves don't do that. Jesus said, if you are going to take back from the strong man, you have to go to his house. And where is his house? His house is hell because his place is no more in heaven. On the earth is an alien. He doesn't have legal authority here. Whatever he takes while he's here, he's only stealing it. So he takes it and takes it to his place. Wherein if you want it, then you're going to have to come and get it. 
And that's why Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The fact that he's assuring us that the gates of hell will not prevail against us is because he expects us to breach the gates of hell. Don't worry, it's going to come together. That was what I was telling you on Tuesday. Let me add something very quickly to what I said on Tuesday so that you can appreciate this better. You know, on Tuesday, I told you that Jesus himself went to hell. He passed through hell. Now he's waiting for us on the other side, waiting to receive us after we have passed through hell as well. Hell is where our brothers and sisters have been held captive. That is where they have been enslaved by Satan to do the bidding of Satan. Hell is where Satan keeps whatever it is that he has stolen from you, that he continues to steal from the body. And so the only way to retrieve it is to go through hell. And that is the reason why the Lord allows the journey of humanity to come to this place that we're in right now, wherein we are literally, from a spiritual standpoint, in hell. Jesus did the same. He went to hell. Why are we afraid to go to the same? How do I know that we are in hell? Let me tell you something. The Bible says in the last days, immorality shall fill the earth. Look around you today. People are giving a thumbs up to evil. People are celebrating wickedness. Do you know what that does to your spirit as a believer? When wickedness is being celebrated, when immorality is being promoted, what it does to you is it causes grief in your spirit. Simply because this is not the order of heaven. The order of heaven is that the name of God be glorified, but the order of hell is that the name of God be dragged in the mud. And so now that the order of hell is what has become of the earth, let me tell you something, what has happened is that the territories of hell have grown and extended beyond Sheol, they have come already to the earth. They brought the battle to us. And we need to push back on that boundary. Why? Because when Jesus returns, we will reign on this earth for a thousand years. As much of the earth that we get to reign over is as much of the earth that we get to reclaim from the boundaries of hell. Hell has been encroaching upon the earth and that is the reason why those who have legal authority in hell are now beginning to function on the earth as though they have legal authority. And you know the implication of that is their behavior, their principles, and their lifestyle is now becoming legalized on the earth. Do you think the reprobate mind is a new spirit? No, the reprobate mind is not a new spirit. It's a spirit that has always been, but it was not able to function in this realm until its new place received access to this place. I know it's a very different theology, but the moment you understand it, then you begin to function better. Many of us are soldiers that are equipped with the whole armor of God, but we are blindfolded. We do not see where the enemy is. And that is the reason why we're not getting any victory because we're just swinging our swords very aimlessly. And Paul said, that's not how to fight. He says, I do not run as one who beats the wind. He said, but I have my eye upon the mark of the prize of the upward call. Let me tell you something. Some of these things, this that I'm sharing with you in particular, when the Lord brought it to me, in the physical, I became drained because I just could not, for the life of me, imagine that on my own. I couldn't think it up on my own. And the Lord said to me, but I showed you that the outpost of heaven has come to the earth. The places wherein I've seen the camp of angels in the last two years are places on the earth that have now become territories of heaven because heaven is on a rescue mission. And so there is an outpost of heaven here. And the Lord said to me, so why are you marveling, marveling that I'm showing you that the outpost of hell has also encroached upon the earth? He said, because we need to meet somewhere. And we are the ones that are caught in the middle and we are the gates that determine what goes out and what comes in. I want to say this to you folks in the times that we are in. Remember what I told you on Saturday, on Tuesday, that every moment that you spend 
not enjoying what Christ has provided for you because the blessings of God are without repentance. They are forever active. They cannot just be hanging in limbo. It's either they are in heaven, in your heart, or they are in hell. If you have pulled it down from heaven by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, but can't maintain it, guess where it goes? It goes to hell because it doesn't go back to heaven. Once heaven releases it, that is it. It is already done. And so every one of those things is in hell. So if you do not know where the boundaries of hell are, how do you want to proceed to reclaiming that which is yours? We need to become more active in the realm of the spirit than many of us have been simply because this battle is not a physical warfare. But the things that are being made manifest give us a very good pointers to where these spirits are being positioned at the moment. I'm going to dial back and give you one example. I knew the reason why, at first I wasn't sure the, the reason why the Holy Spirit said to me to take you back to September 3rd, but now I know. So let me quickly tell you something about September 3rd. On the 3rd of September, I was standing here about to close the service when I saw the angel of the Lord between those two cameras holding a placard that says the time is now, that now is the time. And he says, declare to your brothers and sisters the time that we have come to. And he showed to me that we have come to where? Jeremiah 22, 22. Wherein the Lord says that a wind will blow off the rulers that have held the people captive and anyone who is in love with them will share in their pain, but they will be removed because God is bringing new bringing in a new order. Do you remember that? On the 3rd of September, and I said, the angel of the Lord is saying that the time is now for the old order to leave and for a new order to come. And now that that order has been removed, the Lord said by the ministry of his angel, what will you do with the freedom that you have? The reason why it is important for us to know that is because there are certain principalities within hell who were able to take over some men on the earth who had authority and through those gates they became a hindrance to the rest of us the Lord is saying you've not been able to fight he says but now that the hindrance is being taken what are you going to do and since then we've been trying to answer that question what do we do with this freedom and this liberty that we have are we going to take the liberty and sit and hope that the devil returns all of what he's taking? Or are we going to take that liberty to run as swiftly as we can to the gates of hell and by being active and proactive, recover all? It is as simple as this in your everyday life. When those thoughts come to condemn you, to challenge your righteousness, don't let one moment pass where that thought reigns supreme. Shut it down. Tell whatever spirit is speaking to you, whatever thought is calling you unclean, shut it down in that very moment and say, whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. I am alive to Christ and dead to sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to me because I am in Christ Jesus. Because if you don't shut it down, they want you to spend half a day trying to recover from, a, from an evil thought that you had in the morning. Trying to recover from a question that Satan asked you in the morning that you could not answer. Do you know that quite often we are completely loss of, we are at a loss of joy because Satan asks us questions that we cannot answer? If we ask you things like, well, do you think God can bless you with what you've just done? And guess what? You start making excuses. Every time Satan makes a suggestion in your thought, sometimes Satan will come. Do you think you have the power to say no to that? You said yes to it yesterday. And if according to my record, the day before, you do the same thing. This thing is beyond you. Just accept it. You don't have power. And then guess what? You also accept it. Every time the devil comes, we should do what Jesus did. We should respond back with what is written with the word of God. Because that word of God is the sword that you hold in the realm of the spirit. So that is how proactive we have to be. The Bible says the violent, the proactive, the ones who are willing to take hold of, they are the ones who take hold of it. Satan is not just going to let you have your peace because you just got your hair done. No. He's not going to let you have your peace because you just ministered to somebody at Kroger. He's not going to let you keep your peace because you just read the book of Genesis for the first time in your life, you finished it. He's not going to let you have your peace. If anything at all, he will come after you even more. You have to fight to keep that which Jesus already paid for. Paul said it. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. He said, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities and powers. He says the weapons of our warfare they're not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds and casting down imaginations. Imaginations are such an opposition that the enemy keeps mounting against us and we don't know how to shut it down because we try to reason our way out of the devil's condemnation and out of the, out of the devil's temptation. No, you can't reason your way out of it. You need to exercise authority and you need to be proactive. Let me tell you something. Thoughts can be a defense. Most times in your thoughts, you can defend yourself against certain things. But being on the defensive is not always going to bring you the victory that you need. There are times when you have to go on the offense. When Jesus was going to the cross, he told his disciples, he says, We're gonna, we have to change strategy. He said, when you were going out at first, I told you, don't even take a staff with you. So if you're going and the dog runs across the path, you need to wait and let the dog go because you're not taking the staff with you. He says, I'm sending you out first in passive mode. But what happened? He told them, he says, that was the first time. He said, but this time around, <laughs> I want you to sell your cloak and buy a sword. What is cloak? Cloak is covering. You know, many of us have been so sheltered by the love of God. And we allow the devil to take everything from us. And we're like, oh, I'm just going to wait here until Jesus does it. Jesus is saying, I've already done it. You need to get up and go and take it. You need to go and get what? It done. You need to go and take it. Let me tell you something. The significance of what I am telling you is such that God wants to look down from heaven and see a beloved son in whom he is well pleased. I told you last week, we read from, the, from, from Matthew where the Bible says that when Jesus first came, the Bible says that a bruised reed, it will not break and a smoldering flask, it will not quench. That which is already on its way out, the Bible says it's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt it, but it will bring victory. It will bring justice. But then at the end of the day, when he comes again, how does he come? He comes with millions of his saints, thousands of thousands of saints, and he will ride into victory with a sword in his hand. The same Jesus who came in stealth mode, who acted in passivity, is now coming in the most proactive form that we have ever seen. And he is saying, I need you to do the same. I told you, if they slap you one cheek, you turn the other cheek. He said, but I am also telling you now that if this kingdom is going to be yours, you have to get up and seize it. You need to load yourself with scripture to cast down every imagination of Satan. That one is, by the way, let me go back to what I was saying. You see, today I want to open our minds to see what it means to have the power to beget. Let me finish what I was telling you about John 3.16 and I'm going to connect all the five things that I have said so far. In John 3.16, Jesus says, I'm the only begotten of the Father. And he had to make that clear. He said, because the other sons, he was talking to people who knew that there were angelic visitations and there were aliens who frequented the earth. Back in the day, they knew who they were. When I was teaching this the last time, what example did I give, give you? I gave you the example of the three Hebrew children when they were cast into the fiery furnace. The Bible says that the men of the time, the Babylonians, not the Jews, the Babylonians, people who supposedly did not even know God, when they looked into the furnace, what did they see? They said, we put three men in the fire, but now there is a fourth and his appearance is as of a son of God. So they knew that, wait a minute, this one is not human. This one is from up there. Maybe by his stature, by his height, by the way that he dressed, by the way that he composed himself, something about that one meant he was a citizen of heaven. But he was not born here. Even Melchizedek, who was called the Prince of Salem, the Bible says he had no father, he had no mother, no beginning of days, no end of time. But the reality of it was for him to have authority here, even though his father and mother were not known, he still had to be born here. But he was born not directly of the father. But God used another instrument to bring him to be. But the Lord Jesus was the very first human being that came to earth begotten of God. The Bible says the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and she was found with the Holy Seed. She was found with child and Jesus was born. So what Jesus was telling them is this. I am the only begotten of the Father. Before I came, there's never been anyone who had authority in heaven 
and who also had authority upon the earth. It is either you were a son of God, a citizen of heaven, or you were a son of man, a citizen of the earth. He says, but now that I am here, I give you access to be able to swing both ways. That's a very bad expression for the times that we're in. Let me find another way of putting it. As soon as I said it, I knew that it sounded very wrong because we're talking about the door here. You have to be operate, able to operate in the fullness of that authority, both in heaven and on the earth. Now, come with me. Let me now show you something else. You know, you see, how do I explain this? Okay, wait a minute. You know that we're going to pray at the end for the gates to be lifted and for the doors to be open. Everyone is interested in that prayer because I can guarantee you that everybody here has one thing that has been pending for so long and that is going to be delivered, right? But more than that blessing, you see, the blessing is kind of like a little incentive, whatever it is. You see, everything that God wants to do in your life is possible without any one of those things that you think your future depends on. You know, many of us think that until this happens, oh, I can never do this, oh, I want to do this for God, but I feel so powerless, I feel like I do not have this. No, you see, let me tell you something, God is perfectly able to do whatever he wants to do through you, however he wants to do it. It gives you those targets as a way of exercising your faith. So don't be married to any breakthrough and don't make your destiny conditional upon any material thing. Alrighty? You see, because if you don't settle that within your mind, Satan will use that against you. Satan will use the unholy dependence on those material things. You know, I spoke, we spoke to somebody about a year ago and she was like, oh, I can see that God has a great future for me in my career. But the reason why I have not been able to progress is because I do not have a university degree. And I'm like, wow, okay. I didn't know God was giving degrees now. Because in reality, what he has given to you by which you live and achieve the destiny that he has for you is his word. Because that word becomes faith in your heart. And once you have faith, everything becomes possible. But people always set such limitations. I've told you my story multiple times. The very first time that I dropped out of the university, a friend of mine who was a pastor in the area, was a campus fellowship pastor, he came to me. He said, but why don't you finish it? He said, what if you need this degree in future? I said, first of all, right now, I do not need one. I said, why are you aiming to get one? He said, because, I mean, how is he going to get a job afterwards if he doesn't have a degree? I said, there you go. You are looking for a job. I already have a job. I said, I don't need one. I said, I just, I'm, I just started my second startup. The first startup that I started was so successful. The husband and the wife who were my partners in the business, they bought me out within 18 months. And I was like, but this business is growing. They said, that's why we're buying you out. And the husband said to me, he said, he called me aside, he said, my wife is afraid that the time would come wherein it'd be too difficult for us to write you a check because of where this business is going. That was how successful it was. They bought me out very quickly. I didn't have a care in the world. I was only about 19 years old. I just needed money to just have a good time. So I took the money and I left. So I told him, I said, I'm not looking for a job. I said, I just received funding to start my next business. I said, so you are looking for a job, but I'm not. So, I do not need the degree. He said, but nobody knows, knows the future. What if you need it one day? And I told him, I said, if I ever need one, God will give me the best there is. And in the field that I was in, the field of information security, the number one school in the world to ever offer information security as a master of science degree was Royal Holloway, a University of London. And they invited me to come and be a part of their master's degree program without a first degree. They gave me an unconditional admission because a lot of what they were teaching at the first degree, at the undergrad level, were things that I had read already championed. I could literally teach most of their classes at the undergrad level because I had industry accolades and accomplishments. That is how God works. If you do not limit him, he will do the impossible in your life again and again. It is one of God's favorite pastimes to make the impossible possible. When you want to deny him that opportunity, he steps back and he says, you're not ready for me. Two weeks ago or three weeks ago, what did I tell you about God and the children of Israel? When Pharaoh was about to make the delivery of the children of Israel too easy because of the fact that Moses was his boy. 
And he was like, oh, okay, come on, if you must go. He rolled his eyes and he says, okay, take the people but don't go too far away. God is like, no, that's not the kind of victory that I want. Give me an opportunity to bring out my outstretched arm. He hardened the heart of Pharaoh. So I tell you, as much as God is showing us the key to see the gate lifted and the doors open, he doesn't want you to operate at that level when you're still married to things and when you still believe things are what you need rather than his hand. Praise the Lord. I'm going to say this because of the fact that I know that when I said this a while ago, some people are like, hey, yeah, okay, we hear you, Pastor, but we still want the prophecies. You know, the Lord said to me that I was done prophesying for a season over individuals. Because that was what most of our meetings were about. Prophesying over individuals. And people loved it because it was about them. Those prophecies were about the things that they were dealing with, that they were struggling with. Those prophecies were about which house they should buy, whether should they, they should even attempt to apply for a loan or not. They wanted the confidence to go after the things that they wanted. And the Lord said to me that if we continue beyond that point, many of those people would take the power that was in the prophetic and start to practice sorcery with it. Because the way the Lord raised me, the Lord didn't just raise me as a prophet, he raised me as a teacher as well. So I teach people how I prophesy. I tell you the things that I am seeing in my dreams, in my visions, in the trances that I am in. I tell you what the angels in the room are doing. And many people were sitting there watching and learning and they want to go and apply those principles continuing to chase material things. Whereas the, king, the things of the kingdom are for kingdom pursuit. So now I have learned since then that to release whatever power the Lord has given me exposure into, I need to put the caveat there to make sure that people are not just going after things to their own shame. These gates that have been holding you back and these doors, they will open in this season. By God, they will open because the Lord has delivered the picture that we need to put in mind through the power of imagination and supplication we make our petition and we receive the breakthrough. I guarantee you that it will happen because the Lord will not bring it just to tease us. He brought it because that is exactly what is doing amongst us in this season. But what will you do about that when it comes? So I'm going to take five minutes to put together all the five things that I have said. I started out by telling you that you need to be able to visualize the opening of the gate. I also told you that you are a gate of sort and the promises that you have in the word of God are also doors that are keeping those things from getting to you before you're ready to receive them. And so now you just need to know how to get yourself out of the way and how to allow the word of God to swing open so that the king of glory can come through. Right? So now let me insert something between the second thing and the third thing. The reason why it is important for the king of glory to come through is because the very intent of God for every blessing that you receive and every purpose that you fulfill is so that he can be seen in you. The Bible was, was not, the Bible isn't to, God is not as particular about what comes out of those doors when they open. He's more particular about what goes through. He says, let the gates be lifted. Let the doors be opened so that the king of glory can come through. God wants to be seen fully manifest in your life. And so if we are not putting God first, then guess what's happening to us? We are shortchanging heaven and heaven is not going to be robbed. Look at what God told me this morning. He said to me, he said, tell your brothers and sisters that the key to pressing in to that very next level of active and consistent authority is to become self-aware. But the key to becoming self-aware without being self-destructive is what? Is to be God-conscious. Let me say that again. You need to be self-aware, but you need to be God-conscious. Because many of us, if we are self-aware, Satan was also self-aware. And that is the reason why he kept saying, I, I will do this. I will do that. I will make my throne next to God. I will get the people to bow to me. He was self-aware, but he was not God conscious. So let me tell you the way that it works. God made you, Brother Matthew, in his image and in his likeness. Everything that you are in terms of your identity is defined in the context of who God is. 
And so if you will move in that authority, you need to become self-aware. You need to know who you are because if you don't know who you are, you will be knocking on the wrong doors. If I do not know that I am Moses Anderson who lives at the house that I live at, do you know that I could be knocking someone else's door at 7 p.m. saying, come on, open the door, I live here. And they will look through the window and call the cops because they're like, oh, there's a man here who's gone cuckoo. So the reason why the door opens when I get home is because of the fact that I am what? I am self-aware and God conscious. So many of us, the primary thing that we need to know is who we are in Christ Jesus. The moment you know who you are in Christ Jesus, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. What is the definition of workmanship? Workmanship, according to the Oxford or whatever dictionary, is defined as the perfection of a man's skill set. The way a man demonstrates his skill set is what we call workmanship. If you are a barber and you know how to cut hair, that picture that you put on Instagram of the hair that you've been able to cut the way you want it, that you are proud of, that is your workmanship. And the Bible says that we are God's workmanship because the glory of God expressible on earth is through this thing called man. And so when you live your life, you need to be first of all aware of the fact that you were made for his glory. That is what it means to be self-aware and why you are God conscious at the same time. Because if you're not thinking that way, that authority is not going to be effective. Now let me tell you one more thing and I'm going to continue to number three as I'm summarizing. The Bible says who you are unlocks what you have. Now let me tell you where the Bible says that. Come with me to John chapter 1 verse 12. John chapter 1 verse 12, the Bible says, and I read, but as many as received him, even to them who believe on his name, have we given the power to become the sons of God. For as many as have received him, even to those who believe on his name, have we given the power to become what? The sons of God. There is no way you will receive that kingdom that is coming if you haven't first of all become aware of who you are. When you receive him, the first thing that heaven wants to do for you is give you a sense of yourself relative to God. And from that moment onwards, you can join the group of people that are waiting to see the kingdom come. So who you are, who you have come to know yourself to be, unlocks what you have. You already have all of these things. But because of the fact that you're not aware that it is you. You know one of my favorite examples? I'm sure people here can recite it in their sleep. Is that if you don't know, Brother Matthew, that there is an account opened at Bank of America in your name that has millions and millions of dollars. Can you spend those, can you spend the millions? No, you first of all have to know that it is you. And you need to know who put it there. Because if you go and suddenly find that there is $100,000 in your bank account that you didn't put there, and you start spending it without asking questions, you might have some explaining to do to the FBI eventually when they trace the thing to you. People have suffered that all the time. You know, there are scammers all over the place. And when they're trying to move money from place to place, they just find an account of someone that is vulnerable. They dump the money there, hoping to gain access to that person's identity to eventually take the money. I know these things. I used to work in forensics. One of my first projects in America from the UK was forensics to come and investigate a similar case of money getting stuck somewhere and some people feeling smart and spending it. Eventually, they returned every bit of that money. Some of them had to pay interest on it. So what am I telling you? You need to be self-aware and God conscious. You need to know what's available to you and who made it available. That is the key to exercising that authority. Thing number three that I told us is this. As believers, every single one of us, we have the power to choose to accept where Satan has brought his boundary or to move that boundary. 
And if we don't recognize that it is up to us because Jesus gave us the access to be, to be able to play. You know, like I told you two weeks ago, Jesus paid for you to play. He prayed for you, but he will not play for you. You still have to get up and play for yourself. I remember the man by the name of Kenneth Hagin. One day he hosted Jesus in his room. The Lord Jesus appeared to him in the room and they were talking and they were having a great time and suddenly a cloud came between the two of them and he could no longer see the Lord Jesus. You remember the story? And he was like waiting, thinking, well, today I don't have to pray. Jesus is the one on the other side. So I'm just going to let Jesus do his thing. But when Jesus was leaving, what did he say? He says, all power has been given to me and I give it to you. So if Jesus has given you the power, why are you still expecting him to move the cloud? He said after a while, it just dawned on him that that was his responsibility. So he started to quote scriptures. And as he was quoting scriptures, the image of Jesus started to reappear. That was there. Jesus was there the entire time. Your consciousness and awareness of the divine ability that you have in him is what determines the extent to which your authority functions. I'm going to show you a verse of scripture, Romans chapter 14, verse 6, and then we're going to wrap this thing up. Romans 14, 6. What does it say? It says, He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day, to the Lord, he does not observe the day. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord, he does not eat, and he also gives thanks. Verse 7 says, for none of us lives to himself, and no one dies unto himself. The word of God here is reminding us. That everything that we do, we need to do it as unto the Lord. Many of us don't have a problem with that. But this is what we have a problem with. When Adam received Eve, Brother Greg, did he have a conversation with God about how bored he was and what he needed? No. He did not even know that he needed Eve. There was no Eve. You can't know that you need something that you're not aware of. Right? Now, brother, brother Matthew, have, have you, when was the last time you needed to use an angiantiscope? Angiantiscope? No, because you don't even know what angiantiscope is. So even if I give you an angiantiscope for your birthday and say, oh, brother Matthew, I got you an angiantiscope. If, if there's no clear explanation of what you do with an angiantiscope, it's just going to be there. You won't invite me to your next birthday because I'm the guy who brings presents that nobody can use. You understand what I mean? And so you need to, first of all, be aware of your need for that which has been given. The Bible says everything that we do, we do unto the Lord. You see, the key, ladies and gentlemen, in order for you, the key for you to see your authority functional on the earth, such that the things that are in your mansion above that you need here on the earth can be successfully delivered to you without hindrance. The key is alignment. You need to be able to align who you are to who he is because what he's trying to do is make himself manifest through you. The moment you are out of step with who God is, his light does not reach you and then the beam of his glory is not seen through you. So your, the game that we're playing is a game of alignment. What am I asking of God and why am I asking it? Do you know one of the secrets that I found that helped me to understand what I needed and what I didn't need is by always asking myself this question. This thing that I am asking of God, what will God do with it? What has he done with it in the past? What does he do with it in the lives of men? What does he do with it in the world? The moment you can answer the question of what God will do with what you are asking, you have it. You're asking for money. Ask yourself, when Jesus had money, what did he do with it? The Bible says, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When Jesus had food that was given to him, what did he do? Not only did he eat all by himself, because some of us would say, you know what? 
I've been preaching for three days. You all have been looking at me. It's time for the man of God to be refreshed. He would have eaten the little boy's lunch. But what did he do? He blessed the blessing and then it multiplied and he fed all of his friends. You see, many of us, God wants to give to us everything. If I'm more than anything else in the world, God is more interested than anyone else in the world, including yourself, in blessing you. Because many of us don't even know what we need. But he who made you, he already knows what you need. So Adam was asleep when the Lord formed Eve. But the way that Adam was able to receive that blessing is by being self-aware and God conscious. How was he self-aware? When he looked at Eve, he said, this is bone of my bones. This is flesh of my flesh. And he says, she will be called a woman. You see, when he gave the name and the descriptor, what happened was he claimed her, but he was not able to claim her until he was able to relate that blessing to himself. Let me tell you something. Everything that God wants for you is pending your identity card. You need to be able to bring it out and say, the reason why I am receiving this is because I am a priest and I need that breastplate. The reason why I am receiving this is because I'm a man on a mission and I need the provision. The reason why this door has to open is because now the King of Glory is about to manifest himself through me as an evangelist to the nations because once he was, he's about to manifest himself through me as a healer of nations because that is who he is. You see, knowing that which is on the inside of you allows for there to be a match with what is above you that you're willing to receive. I'm going to summarize that last point from the book of Psalms 107. You see, Psalm 107 makes it very clear. The reason why it is important for us to know what is inside so that we can receive that which is pending. Psalm 107 verse 7. And look at what it says. It's the Bible says, And he led them forth by the right way, that they may go to a city for a dwelling place. He led them where? He led them forth by the right way that they may go to dwell for, go to a city for a dwelling. Let me tell you something. Nobody ever goes to dwell in a city that has not been taken. Nobody goes to dwell in a city with the intention of sleeping on the streets. Every time we think about dwelling in a city, we think about a home, a place, that is ours. You see, the Lord is saying, I am going to lead you so that you can find the place that is yours where everything that is yours is preserved. But he will lead you. But just imagine if you don't even know that there is a city. One, Im imagine if you don't know that you have precious things that have to be kept in a house. The Bible says by wisdom a house is built, by understanding it is established, and by knowledge it is filled with every good thing. All the good things that God has for you, God wants there to be a dwelling place, an abode, a conscious place wherein you are consciously building and preparing for the image of God to be made manifest in your life. I want to challenge you, look at everything that you have asked God for that is pending and ask yourself, have I made enough room for the Lord to receive this thing with me? Have I made enough room in my own life for this addition to enable me reveal the glory of God? If the gates are going to open and the doors are going to be opened, I'm not supposed to be focused on the blessings that can come out of them as much as I need to be focused on the glory of God that can be made manifest in me. Ask yourself this one question. Does this give me the power to be a son of God? Does this give me the power to be the express image of God? If you can answer that question, then guess what happens? Nothing gets in the way. Because you, who is the man that is supposed to be ordinary wood, you have now laid yourself over with the glory of God. You see, that overlay of gold is what qualifies you to be in the temple of God. That overlay of gold is what qualifies you to be that gate that lifts up. And once you have lifted up because you're in alignment with God, the doors of those promises in the word of God that is holding your place of authority, they open up to you. That dwelling place 
is the place where your authority is functional, where your authority is active. I'm going to say this one last thing from the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. And then we're going to pray for the gates to open. Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, God made a statement here that I believe very strongly is one of the most powerful things that happened on the, on, during the week of creation. The Bible says, God said, let there be light and there was light. Verse 4 says, and God saw that the light was good and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the very first day. The first day of God's creation. God says, let there be light and there was light. Brother Matthew, can I use you an example? As an example. Alan, can I use you as an example? If both of you will come on stage, if you can climb here, that would be great. Just both of you come on stage. I'm going to let you be in the back and I'm going to let Brother Matthew be in the front. Both of you face me. Brother Matthew, stretch forth your hand like that. Both of them. Now, I want you to imagine for a second that standing behind Brother Matthew is heaven. God's already made heaven. And everything in heaven is the way God wants it to be. Remember that when God was done making the earth, what did he say? The Bible says, behold, they looked at all of what he had made on the earth and it was all good. You can't say something is good unless there is a standard that you're comparing it to. And it is good because now it looks like heaven. But in order for me to see what's in heaven, there needs to be a passage for that light that is called heaven to cast its image upon the earth. And so when God said, let there be light, God created the opening between eternity and time to bring a full reflection of heaven. As long as this image is different from the light that is coming, what are we going to have here? A shadow. Because when you have an object in front of the light, guess what happens? That object casts a shadow. So what God said at the beginning, to begin anything at all, he says, let there be light. And guess what? The light was fully delivered. And now God is saying, I want everything that has been standing in the way of the king of glory, of the light that I am, of the miracle worker that I am, of the grace giver that I am in your life. I want them to be removed so that I can come through. And so the way we're going to do that is that you need to recognize that what is coming through you is God himself. And so if you're believing God for a miracle, for something to open up, it has to be able to take the shape of the one that is coming through. Otherwise, we will use all of that greatness of the light of God to cast shadow upon the earth. You may be seated. Many of the things that we have received from God because we have not learned how to align ourselves with him so that his light is passing through perfectly through the motif of our lives have become the shadows. Many of us are battling with things that was intended to be a blessing simply because we did not bring it under our alignment to God. And God is saying, I'm not going to let you do that to yourself anymore. I allow that so that you can learn the value of alignment. If there will be light, you need to be in alignment with me. Because light travels in a straight line. The moment there is an offset, the light doesn't make you through. But you saw what I just demonstrated. The glory of God is looking to come through you. But while that glory of God is outstretched, if you are like this, then guess what? All of that hand will cast a shadow because you have not created an opening for it. I want to encourage you folks. Look at what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 12 on your own when you get home. Look at what he was saying again in Matthew chapter 18 when you get home. When you read these two chapters, you will see how Jesus laid down the principles of how men need to live their lives in such a way that they're not taking up things that will be a hindrance to God. So now we're going to rise up and we're going to break bread and then we're going to pray. While we're breaking bread today, we're not going to read any scripture. But I want to share this notion with you as you're breaking bread today. There is a lot that is being said in here to empower you to be able to get out of the way so that the glory of God can come through. If you are that gate and if the word of God is that door, then you need to be in alignment with the word of God so that there can be an opening for the light of the glory of the king himself to come through. 
So what I want us to do today as we break bread is pray against one thing. When Jesus broke bread with his disciples, all 12 of them were there at the beginning. But one of them went out of alignment and that was Judas Iscariot. And the reason why Judas Iscariot went out of alignment was what? Was because he was thinking only about himself. He was being self-centered. He was being self-aware without being God conscious. And that took him completely out of the plan of God. And when the resurrected Christ came in his glory, Judas could no longer experience that glory. And so today, I want to let you know that God is willing, has always been willing to release upon each and every one of us everything that we need to fulfill destiny. But he doesn't want us to consume it upon ourselves. So we're going to speak against selfishness. You will tell yourself, because sometimes we think, oh, you know, I love the Lord. I just want to do his will. No, I'm not just talking about your conscious mind, but I'm talking about things that may be hidden from you in your subconscious. So I want you to say to yourself today that everything that may be in me that is for me and not God, let it be taken away. Whatever it was that was in Judas kept pushing him to do his will when he had an opportunity to do the will of God. And so I want to encourage you today, mean it in all godliness. Mean it with all sincerity. That any wicked ways that may be in you, you are giving God access at this particular point in time to remove it far from you. As the Lord Jesus laid down his life, as he allowed his body to be broken, as we are breaking bread today, I want you to do the same. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, you are my ultimate example. As you allowed your body to be broken, I am allowing my flesh to be broken. Whatever it is that I am carrying that does not reflect the glory of God, that will be a hindrance to the glory of God, let it be ripped away from me. I just want to be able to deliver the glory of the King. A miracle is around the corner, but let me tell you something, self, can become a hindrance if it is not submitted to God. If we are going to beget, we have to remain in the way that we were begotten of God. So we take the bread today and the wine and we declare that as Jesus laid it all down, we also will lay it down. There is somebody in here today, you're holding onto a card that you shouldn't. You might think, oh, it's just a car. What does God care? God cares because God sees how much of your time, how much of your attention that car is taking. You're holding on to it and you know you should let it go. So I want to encourage you right now in the mighty name of Jesus to go ahead and let go of it. You're not going to ride that car into glory. It might be as mundane as a car, but what it's taking from you is your attention and God seeks that attention. The Bible says that the eye of the Lord is running to and fro upon the earth, seeking for that man whose mind is stayed on him. And this applies to every single one of us. If there's anything that we're holding on to that we make, we have convinced ourselves that our lives depend on it. If God is saying, let it go, give it to me, give it up. It's not because God wants it so that he can add to his collection. He's asking for you to remove it because it's getting in the way of his light that is about to shine. And before we go on today, the Lord's given me an assignment today. When I saw, short, no long after I saw the gate, I saw yet another gate that had a chain that was tied to it. And many of us, unknown to us, unbeknownst to us, we have been signed up to pay the debt of some others. Many of us like to call it generational curses. And sometimes it's not even in the form of a curse, it's just ignorance. There are certain things that we have been told, that we have held on to, that we have believed that is actually untrue. Every false knowledge that may be holding your gate down from lifting up will be broken in here today in the mighty name of Jesus. So as we break bread today, I want to address that situation. All of us collectively, we're, sp we're speaking against self-centeredness, self-awareness that denies God 
any awareness that is not God conscious, we renounce it today. Every element, item, material thing, position or place that we are holding on to that is keeping the light of the glory of God from shining through us, we also let it go. We receive the grace to let it go today. And for the few amongst us who may have such chains tied to our gates, today the Lord said the way that it will be broken is as we pray, certain individuals will come to your mind. Certain names will come to your mind. And I want you, as they come to your mind, to say, Lord, I am not paying their debt because Jesus paid mine. You see, the Bible says, let every man bear his burden and the burden of others too. The debt of some of what our fathers have done, some of what our mothers have done, some of what's been done in our families, some of what, was, some of what we were preached, that was preached to us while we were growing up, that was taught to us, that is now constituting a chain. Once those thoughts come to your mind, some of you, you may just remember your elementary school. Wherever it is that that came from, it is time for it to go. When it comes to your mind as we're breaking bread, just renounce it and say, Lord, I am not paying that debt. I am not paying for that false knowledge anymore. I am not paying for that ignorance anymore. I am not paying for that wickedness anymore because Jesus has set me free. My desire is that every one of us will live here today with gates lifted and doors open so that the King of glory can come in. And one last thing, as we break bread, remember we're in the season of fours. One last thing as we break bread is this. I want you to say to yourself, once Jesus broke the bread with his disciples and proceeded to the garden of Gethsemane, he laid down his will and declared that the will of the Father be done. The will of God is for you to pray always. The devil has attacked you and I in the place of prayer and continues to. While the worship was on, this was something the Lord showed to me very clearly. And I'm going to talk to you afterwards in particular, the man that I saw, you hit your knee, knees to pray and thoughts came to your mind and you're like, oh, I'm going to quickly go and fix that. And then after a while, it became a habit. Whenever you're about to pray, you remember things you want to fix. And so you have been fixing and doing things without praying. And that is the reason why nothing is fixed and nothing is done. So today, I want you to say, not my will, but yours be done. So Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the privilege of being able to do this in remembrance of the Lord Jesus. The Bible says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. So Lord Jesus, we receive your body and we receive your blood so that we can deny ourselves like you denied yourself. So that we can take up our crosses and follow you like you took your cross to Golgotha. So that the wood that we are, having been dead to sin and alive to you, becomes overlaid with your glory. And as those golden bars and hinges we resume our place. We become conscious of our place as the gates that needs to be lifted up. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, all of these privileges we thank you for. In Jesus' name, you may eat and you may drink. Unto liberty and freedom. Praise the Lord. All right, and now we're going to pray. Every single one of us, if we can, let's lift up our right hands. We have come to a moment of deliverance. One of the things that is going on in the season that we're in is very recently the enemy came at us with the spirit of heaviness. That spirit of heaviness is part of the manifestation of the beast that the Bible says is coming from the abyss. On Tuesday, myself and Alan were planning a presentation. He's going to share with you a dream that the Lord showed to him and I'm going to share with you what the Lord tells me that it means. But I can't wait until then because already that which the Lord revealed to us about the beast coming from the abyss is such that it constitutes heaviness upon our hearts wherein even though we're willing, we're not able because we feel so weighted down. So as you lift your hand today, 
what you're doing is very simple is a prayer of supplication for those of us who haven't looked into what that means a prayer of supplication is a humbled prayer a prayer wherein you humbly ask God for help so say Lord lift my hand lift me from any heaviness lift me out of every heaviness into freedom into peace where I'm reminded a place where I am reminded that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus Lord lift me and Father with the mighty name of Jesus I thank you because hands have been lifted in this place men and women have been delivered from heaviness Father with the mighty name of Jesus every heaviness that has stopped us from getting up to look at what you have written now Lord is falling off from us in the mighty name of Jesus I want to just pray for you Kaneda because what I see as I was talking about the fact that there are things that have been written for our attention but heaviness is not allowing us to embrace the truth I see you standing looking like 180 degrees you're looking this way and you're looking that way but there is a set of instructions written on the board behind you and if you don't mind let me just grab that right hand if you don't mind and I want to pray for you that any distraction that has been keeping you away from the one thing that is needful, that the Lord will pull them down in his mercy. I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that you will have a turnaround to be able to see very clearly that which the Lord has written. The Lord says to remind you that his burden is light and his yoke is easy. What he's asking you to do is not even as much as the things that you have been engaged in because of distractions. Yes, the Lord sees your heart and he knows that you mean well. He knows that you care. He knows that what you've been doing is here a little, there a little, trying to do this and that just like Martha. But the Lord is saying, I have seen it. I honor your dedication. And that is why I am bringing you to fulfill this season like Mary did. Paying attention only to that which is needful. Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, I release over this woman right now the grace to be at peace to focus and to let go so that she can operate from a place of rest in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord would have me remind you that the things of September 3rd, I started saying it but I was led the other way, are already in fulfillment very speedily. So go and listen to every message that I have preached after September 3rd. Because in every one of those messages, there were individual declarations, things that were declared over individuals and over the church. As speedily as the prophecy of September 3rd is coming to pass, those things are coming to pass as well. If you're wondering what do I mean by the visions of September 3rd, the Lord says that the leaders that have held most of the world captive will begin to fall by the wind of God. And we're beginning to see that. And the Lord is telling me, and I want to share this with you, those leaders are not just men and women. We've seen men and women who have lost their seat of power because the Lord is changing God upon the earth. But the Lord brought to my attention very recently that some of those that have held the world captive for a long time are also currencies. And that is the reason why you see that certain currencies that used to hold sway over the world are beginning to fall. Let me tell you something, these things are happening very speedily. We're not even in November 3rd yet. So has it been two months? No. And these things are happening. Now, after we saw that, I'm, I'm going to say this very plainly because I, I don't want anybody to not get what I am saying. Five days after the angel of the Lord said to me that the rulers are falling and it is now that the Lord is removing them and lifting up his. Five days after that, the queen passed. So that you and I can see that it is possible for there truly to be a change of God because in most of our lifetimes, one man or one woman has held that much power. To help your faith to believe that truly God is opening up the seat of control, the thrones of Revelations 20, so that you can come and take your place to reign with Christ. But it came with a warning. The Lord says that certain miscreants who have been around the rulers will think that now, they can take over. And the Lord says that we need to pray against their activities. We prayed 
against two pol political figures. I didn't tell their name because the Lord did not give me the release to tell what their name is. But we prayed anyway that for the ones who are overstaying their welcome, a man and a woman, that the Lord will take them out to avoid, for us to avoid the inconveniences that would come if they're not removed. Let me tell you this, what God will do, he will do, but certain inconveniences can be avoided. While I was telling you that, do you also remember that I said that one of the leaders that have been taken out is being replaced by a woman? A woman that came into her place came with seven agendas and the Lord said to me, shut down those agendas. How many people remember me saying that? That a woman came up with seven agendas and she wants to fill the shoes of the queen. Let me say this, I say this to you today without any fear of reprimand by man because I am called by God. We saw what just happened. The woman herself has resigned from her position. What happened to those seven agendas? They have beaten the dust and they will not see the light of day. If the Lord is bringing to pass very speedily those things that he has said concerning the rulers of the world, how much more you for whom Christ died? He will bring to pass the things that he has said, the elevation in the place of dreams, the closeness of your heart to his heart. Those things that the Lord has been telling us about our walk with him are also being expedited. But this is one thing that I want you to set your eyes on. The Lord said that we have come to a season of miracles. Miracles will happen. But more than miracles that you have been anticipating, the Lord has a request. The Lord is saying, I want you to become a miracle. Let your presence in someone's life as a friend be transformative. I'm going to say that slowly because I don't want to contradict myself. I said to us, we have not come to the time of sharing our oil with people. But the fact that you don't share your oil does not mean you cannot give an instruction. The five wise virgins, they said, we're not giving you the oil, but they give them an instruction. They said, go and buy. What they do with that instruction is not your problem. It is their problem, but it is your responsibility to say it. And so, if you would, I encourage you to partner with the Holy Spirit in the next couple of days leading into November to give an instruction as the Lord lays on your heart. You need to tell some people the truth with a straight face and not be afraid how they're going to take it simply because it is yours to deliver. It is theirs to repent. Let us not mince words with people because the Bible says he that wins a soul is wise. I want to encourage you to speak the truth without any fear of reprimand. We're going to say this last prayer sitting down and I want you to turn in your Bibles. You're going to read out this prayer yourself from the book of Psalms 107 verse 3. By now we should have memorized Psalms 107 because the Lord keeps leading us to it a lot in recent times. 107 verse 3 and we're going to turn this into a prayer and I want you to make it a personal prayer just between you and the Lord. And look at what it says. Psalms 107 and I'm going to read only verse 3. And it says, And gathered out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Just for a little context, let me show you what it says. Verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom the Lord has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And gathered out of the lands, from the east and from the west, and the north and the south. The gathering of the Lord is with an outstretched arm. And that is the reason why there are no more safe zones in the world. The trouble that has come to the east is coming to the west. The trouble that the south has experienced, the north will have a taste of. Why? Because the Lord is gathering his people. So I want you to pray a prayer of recommitment. Commit yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, into your hand, I commit my spirit. So that when the troubles of the East come to the West, I will not worry. Please, I am begging you to say this prayer. On Tuesday, perhaps I will have the leading to go ahead and tell you exactly what is going on. There are winds that are blowing in the world today. Two of those strong winds are the political and the economic wind. And so in order for your peace to remain intact, you need to pray what Jesus prayed. Jesus was about to be taken to the cross. He was about to be beaten. He was about to be troubled greatly with such a trouble that no man has been made subject to. And he realized that the only way to make it through was to hide his spirit 
in God. He says, into your hand, I commit my spirit. I want you to say that because the Lord is about to gather his people. And so don't just sit here and look at what is happening in the West, on the East side and say, oh, I don't know, those people, they're sinners. This is God's own country, we'll be fine. No, the gathering is from the East to the West, from the South to the North. There are no more safe zones. And so pray that your heart will be secure. And the way to do that is to put your hand into his hand and to take your spirit and put it in him. And the Lord will keep you in perfect peace. Those whose minds are stayed on him. Some of you, you have to go off the news for a while until your heart is fully reinforced before you expose yourself again. You have not built enough strength against the tirades of bad news. And so what you need to do is you need to withdraw yourself and have your soul fortified so that when the day comes, you are not troubled. One more time, say, Lord, into your hand, I commit my spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I have one piece of bright update that I'm going to share before Alan comes to pray over the offering. One of the things that the Lord took me in the spirit to reveal to me of late is this. On Thursday, we had a leaders meeting and we were praying and fasting. And ahead of the prayer meeting, the Lord took me very quickly in the spirit and said to me, he says, I have saved you. He says, but now I want to show my strength through you. You know, that was what David prayed. David says, Lord, you saved me by your name. He said, but you vindicated me by your, by your strength. After we said that prayer, I was thinking only about communion house. And now God is about to vindicate us with miracle signs and wonders. And you know what the Lord said to me after that? He said that things are about to unfold in the world that the news cannot deny, which will give you an opportunity to reflect my glory. So wherever God has placed you in your neighborhood, in your family, in your place of work, get ready for those people who did not know that you existed to begin to acknowledge the power of God that is about to be made manifest in you. So how do you prepare for this greatness? The way you prepare for this greatness is very simple. I want to encourage you, go home and write down four things that you know God has given to you. For example, I know God has given me the grace to teach, to prophesy. He has given me the grace to intercede and he has also given me strong spirit of resilience. Many people have tried to get me to stop preaching the kind of messages that I preached, that I preach, but I have that resilience to continue to announce that the kingdom is coming. So write down four things that God has given to you. Is it skill in business? Is it friendliness, the ability to make friends? Write down four things as you prepare for this glory of God and then present it to the Lord and say to the Lord, every single one of these things is now yours to use you will be amazed at the testimonies that will be penned down in your name in the days ahead. God bless you. Alan. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What a word, what a word tonight. Father, we give you praise. We're gonna prepare for offering. You'll see the slide uh, here above. If you need an envelope, we have envelopes here, as well as the, as the basket and pens. We're not gonna belabor it. We're gonna give God praise. Let's just take a few minutes to prepare if you're given by mobile. Given the instructions on the screen. Praise the Lord. For his word declares that he gives seed to the sower. Father, we thank you. All right. Whichever mode of giving that you have set up, whether you're doing the envelope or you have your phone, if you have your phone, just lift your phone up once you've given. We're going to give God praise for what he's doing in our life. Father, we thank you. There's none like you. For we know indeed you have given this seed, O oh God, for us to sow. And Father, we give back to you what is yours. We thank you so much, O oh God, for what you have placed before us today, what you have prepared for us, what you have imparted into us tonight, O oh God. Father, we ask of thee that these offerings 
that these times, O oh God, be sweet smelling unto you, that they be pleasing in your sight. Father, look upon every household represented here, for we know your word declares that you know what we need before we ask. And Father, we thank you, for you indeed are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. All glory and honor belong to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen, amen. Let's just stand as we begin to wrap up. We're going to uh, just give a brief word of prayer. We know a lot of our sisters are out on the women's retreat. Come on. We're just going to lift them up, pray for traveling mercies on their way back. Father, we thank you for the ones that you've placed in this house, oh God. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing where they are. Oh God, we ask of thee that you command your angels to take charge over them. Oh God, and bring them back safely. Father, we thank you for us here, oh God, that you have ordained to be here this night to receive your word. Command your angels even still to take charge over us that we dash not our foot against the stone. Yes. Father, we thank you for the man of God that you set before us to minister your word, to minister the gospel. Oh God, for you have prepared this night of impartation, for you indeed have spoken to our spirits. Now let us be stirred. Let us see visions in the night season, O God. I even pray thee for Lord freely have we received, freely we give back, O God. Every one of you that have desired to operate in that gift, Lord Jesus, let them experience that even this week, Father. We give you praise for your glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I look forward to seeing you all this upcoming Tuesday. Y'all have a blessed week.